Well, good morning. My name is Steve Ward, and I have the intimidating honor of chairing a panel of distinguished Turing Award winners. As you know, the Turing Award is the most prestigious award available in computer science. And our panelists include uh, Professor Andrew Yao, uh, who has been on many faculties, including MIT's, and is currently uh, from Tsinghua in Beijing. Um, MIT's Ron Ravest, and MIT's Barbara Liskoff, and uh, Butler Lampson, who hails from both MIT and Microsoft, and uh, Professor Fernando Corbato of MIT. Um, I thought we would get started by asking each panelist in turn to uh, say a few retrospective words about the work that earned them the Turing Award, uh, perhaps uh, shedding a little light on their motivation and what their retrospective view is of, of the impact of their work. And uh, I thought we would do this in kind of chronological order. So uh, I'll start with uh, Corby, uh, uh, who was cited for pioneering work organizing the concepts and leading the development of the general purpose, large scale, time sharing and resource sharing computer systems, CTSS and Multics. Corby? Thank you. Well, I'm, re I'm reminded that, it, first of all, that it was 50 years ago this, this spring that MIT had its 100th anniversary. And uh, right here in Kresge, there was a series of symposia, one of which was uh, on, uh, chaired by Martin Greenberger who, of the Sloan School, who uh, had a symposia called uh, Computer Management and the Computer Computers of the Future. Uh, that was published eventually by, in a book uh, by MIT Press, and uh, it got relabeled, and computers and, and, and the computers and the world of the future. Uh, it's still in print, actually. Uh, on a thanks to demand printing, and for forty dollars you can get it. Uh, most notably, in that particular session on on com computing, there was a lecture by John McCarthy, uh, who subsequently went to Stanford and and got a Turing Award also. But uh, he was uh, his seminal work was done began here at MIT. But he, in particular, in his talk in, this, in that symposia, advocated time sharing and uh, made a good case for it. Uh, and the notion of a computer utility as well. Uh, the other thing is that computing 50 years ago was only a, a little over 10 years old. 10 years old modern computing, that is, programming. Uh, and the thing that was staggering at the time was how frozen the attitude of the uh, industrialists were and the computing, man computing manufacturers. They really didn't understand why they needed to change anything. And uh, time sharing was against the grain. And uh, so CTSS was started out, it was, it was kind of a hack. It was going to be a demo. It, it gradually, as it succeeded, grew and grew, and it was quite successful. Um, one of the other things I would notice is that time sharing was, was, was the phrase, but the real goal was man-machine interaction, or as Licklider said, uh, man-machine symbiosis. Uh, there were two key people in that evolution. One was Licklider, uh, who was an inspiring advocate, and Bob Fano, who, my friend, was, who was also uh, very wise and the leader of, who was, had the leadership to start Project Mac, from which CSAIL evolved directly. Um, I think there's a lecture. Of, of Fano gave a presentation in anticipation of this, of this celebration 
uh, which is on the web, I believe. Uh, and then finally, a last remark would be that CTSS and Multics, uh, which succeeded it, were, a pre were precursors to the contemporary systems and networks. Uh, and uh, all of the interfaces and, and ideas that have shown up now in, uh, have set, and set the stage for personal computing and the Altos, which Butler, I'm sure, will talk about, and, and the PC world uh, that we know today, uh, came out of, were st got started in time sharing as people began to learn to interact in a real-time basis. Uh, it also led to things like Unix uh, and, and the C, C programming language, and ultimately today is being rediscovered in cloud computing. Well, thank you, Corby. Yeah. Um, and if Corby was the consummate system builder of the 1960s, I think Butler Lampson certainly deserves that honor for the 70s. Uh, he was cited in 1992, uh, he, when he earned his, his Turing Award, for contributions to the development of distributed personal computing environments and the technology for their implementation. Workstations, networks, operating systems, programming systems, displays, security, and document publishing. It's hard to know what got left off of that list. <laughs> Butler? I can tell you exactly what got left off. <laughs> 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 Spreadsheets and the web got left off. <laughs> um, when Xerox started the computing part of the Z Xerox Palo Alto Research Center in 1969, their short-term motivation was that they had just made a foolish mistake and bought a computer company. Um, their longer-term motivation was that they were able to see that uh, the light lens copying business over which they had a monopoly at the time was going to be very nice for a decade or two, but it was not going to last forever. And uh, the senior management of Xerox thought that they ought to pr prepare for the future. So they started this lab, and they told us to invent the office of the future. Of course, they had no idea what that meant, and neither did we. Um, but it turned out to be a very fruitful um, instruction to give us, because based on that, we were able to uh, develop pretty much all of the things that you're now accustomed to uh, in, the, in the world of, of um, personal computing, uh, networking and um, local file systems and uh, drawing programs and document editing. And, uh, the first internet was actually built at Xerox PARC. For some mysterious reason, uh, Xerox decided that we shouldn't publish anything about it, so the people who did the work never got much credit. But they did go to the seminar at Stanford where Vint Cerf was developing the uh, internet protocols. And uh, they weren't allowed to talk about the internal network, but they were allowed to ask questions. And they asked a lot of questions. And finally, Vint looked at one of them and he said, you've done this before, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> so we did all that stuff. We didn't do spreadsheets. That would have been technically possible uh, on the equipment that we had. Uh, but we had no personal use for spreadsheets since although their use has expanded a lot more recently, uh, originally they were meant for accountants and we didn't do accounting. And we weren't particularly, we didn't get along very well with the people at Park who did do accounting. <laughs> uh, so that's why we didn't do spreadsheets. And the reason we didn't do the web was that we didn't have a big enough sandbox to play in. Um, my theory about the reason that the web came along when it did is that um, that was the first time the internet was big enough to make it worthwhile for people to actually uh, post things on it. Anyway, we did invent all this stuff, and, and it's pretty much the direct uh, predecessors of all the stuff that, that people use today. Uh, even the first, quote, laptop, unquote, was built at Park in the, in the late 70s. OK, thank you. Um, Andy, you were awarded the Turing Award in the year 2000 uh, in recognition of fundamental contributions to the theory of computation including the complexity-based theory of pseudo-random number generation, cryptography, and communication complexity. Can you give us your retrospective view of that work and its impact and your motivation? I think my Turing Award was mainly due to the proposal of two concepts. 
around 1980. Uh, this concept would lead to the creation of uh, two subfields in theoretical computer science, which over the years have uh, shown a lot of depth and applications. And the first of this is communication complexity, which captures the amount of communications needed when several computers want to perform a joint computation based on their private inputs. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, second concept that I proposed was about uh, the perfect pseudo-random number generator. Pseudo-random pseudo number generation uh, has been, had been a, a very uh, important subject uh, in simulations and in other fields. And uh, the, the standard statistical theory about it is that uh, whether a pseudo-random number generator is good or not depends on the application. And uh, typically, you have some sort of mathematical statistical test for seeing whether it's good or not. Now, with the advent of cryptography, uh, we have to be more stringent, and we have to think about, uh, is there a way so that we can define a good definition of pseudo number, random number generator, so that it can satisfy the very ri rigorous requirements? And uh, so I uh, proposed a definition, which is, I think is pretty outrageous. It's, um, I was asking the question, uh, is it possible to have a pseudo-random number generator that can pass all the uh, statistical tests that people can think of? And it actually turned out to be the case. And, and uh, uh, with the help of computational complexity and uh, myself and many of my colleagues together, we have created uh, to make it work. And now, in retrospect, uh, I think it probably should not have been a surprise that uh, concepts like this would lead to uh, ramifications. And uh, the reason is that around 1980, there were two seminal intellectual trends uh, that started to happen in computer science. One is the, uh, the uh, uh, change from ma main kind of single machine to network uh, setting. And uh, I think as pioneered by uh, uh, people like Bertler and others. Uh, so the, uh, the cost consideration would no longer be just the computation time for one single machine, but actually you have to take the communication cost into account. And the second uh, uh, seminal uh, uh, intellectual trend that was started at the time is that uh, at that time, the, uh, uh, the proposal of the public key cryptography uh, let far-sighted people to think about in the future, maybe we will have a big network and we can do electronic commerce and cryptography will be very useful and, and important. And uh, uh, now, when you think about cryptography, uh, uh, the traditional theory uh, was the Shannon theory of cryptography. But Shannon theory, uh, was very uh, rigorous. However, it's perhaps too rigorous. If you insist on that security, then you practically cannot do any electronic commerce. And so uh, I think at that time, near, near the end of the 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s, many of us were struggling to try to break away from the Shannon cage. And instead, we would embrace the computational complexity to become our savior, and so that we can construct frameworks so that uh, cryptography will be rigorous and will be meaningful. And uh, so I think that given uh, those two, two, two trends, I think that it should have come no surprise that those of, of us who were lucky enough in those early days who started to uh, think about such issues uh, would come up with uh, concepts that would be, uh, become very important. And uh, um, I'm, uh, uh, perhaps I should explain why I'm here. Uh, I'm, I, I think all, all my distinguished friends here are MIT uh, faculty members. I think that, firstly, I, I was a faculty at MIT during 
1975 to 1976. And uh, 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 secondly, uh, I think my work has been influenced by uh, a lot of the uh, MIT people uh, who are here today. I think, uh, 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 for example, in the communication complexity by Harold Abelson and uh, the pseudo number number generation by uh, uh, Ron Rivest, uh, Shafi Goldwasser, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Sylvia McCauley. And um, I think there's an uh, interesting uh, 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 story that, uh, that um, uh, I think Ron, if you forgive me, that I would just repeat it. I think Ron uh, always uh, uh, joked with me that, um, that I, I missed the boat because I left MIT uh, <laughs> at uh, 1976. Otherwise, I would uh, I perhaps be able to uh, get a Turing Award together with them. Uh, but fortunately, I went to Stanford and, uh, I, and then later on had the opportunity to mix with the Berkeley crowd. And so I guess I, I um, uh, got into cryptography uh, uh, on the West Coast. And I guess I didn't, uh, I, I guess everything is probably preordained after all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Um, Ron, you were awarded the Turing Award in 2002 for ingenious contribution for making public key cryptography useful in practice. Your retrospe retrospective view? Yeah, sure. Uh, so a Andy's talked about some of the, uh, the themes that were around in those days. So our, our work uh, was inspired by the Diffie-Hellman paper talking about public key cryptography. And it asked the question whether public key cryptography was possible. And uh, with Len Edelman and Adi Shamir, uh, who are also members of uh, not CCL, but LCS at the time, although members of the math department, and that shows the, the strength of the interdepartmental character of, of, of the uh, enterprise uh, uh, of computer science. Um, we came up with a proposal um, known as the RSA scheme. Now, I guess if, you, if you'd stayed around, it might have been RSA-Y or... Or, or, yeah. or, or, or why or, RSA? Why, why RSA? Or <laughs> 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 the orders. Or why RSA? Or, or whatever, yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> so so um, anyway, we came up with a proposal, which is uh, so far stood the test of time. Uh, based on the difficulty of factoring the product of two large prime numbers and, and doing some modular exponentiation for encryption and for decryption. Um, you know, we still don't know in the end whether it's secure or not. We have many open problems in the field of uh, computer science and, and theory, and, and showing that a problem is hard remains one of the most challenging problems we have, uh, and we don't know whether specific problems like um, factoring are hard or, or particular crypto systems are hard. But uh, cryptography has thrived, and one of the impacts uh, that our work had, I think, is to really help establish uh, the, the character of the questions that people ask, and, and the kind of questions you can ask and answer is, can you design crypto systems so that the difficulty of breaking that crypto system is closely related or identical to uh, some hard problem that, you're, that you believe to be hard, and you make explicit assumptions that factoring is hard, or discrete logarithm is hard, or doing discrete log on elliptic curves is hard, or something like that. And the field has really blossomed in a very nice way, uh, in spite of our inability to show that these particular problems are hard, because we can make very crisp assumptions saying, if you, if you assume that these problems are hard, then you can achieve these cryptographic objectives. And so the field has, has really blossomed in a, in, a, in a wonderful way and, and achieved a lot of paradoxical things. I think the public key um, uh, work itself it, it demonstrates the paradoxical character that, that cryptography can have, uh, that, that you can ask something which seems like you shouldn't be able to, to do it, uh, and, and yet you can in the end with, with a clever use of, of, of the tools at hand. And that, that's a theme that appears over and over again, is that by making the right assumptions, by being careful about your reductions, and asking what appear to be paradoxical uh, questions, a paradoxical set of requirements, you can actually achieve some of these things. Well, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Ron. And Barbara, your 2008 uh, Turing Award cited contributions to practical and theoretical foundations for programming language and system design especially related to data abstraction, fault tolerance, and distributed computing. Um, OK, well, Corby started by mentioning John McCarthy. So I wanted to say that John McCarthy was my thesis advisor at Stanford. Uh, and I was working in AI at the time. But as soon as I got my PhD, I switched into computer systems. I went to work at the MITRE Corporation. And while I was at MITRE, I started to work on programming methodology because there was a huge concern at the time, and of course there's still a concern about what they then called the software crisis, by which they meant we had no idea how to build software that actually did what it was supposed to do. 
<laughs> and I found this problem very intriguing, and so I was thinking about it. And um, I moved to MIT in 1972, and this was the problem that was consuming me. What would be the right way to organize software so that we could actually control the complexity and reason about uh, the resulting programs? And I had in mind a particular way of organizing programs, which I referred to as the multi-operation module. So the idea was that I had a big black box, and inside there was complicated data structures and very complex code, but it was all hidden inside the box. And uh, the box provided an interface that consisted of a number of operations, and outside the box you could call these operations, but that was the only way you could interact with the box. And this seemed to me like a really good way to organize programs. And there were other people that had similar ideas, like Dave Parnas at the same time. But I felt that uh, it was very hard to communicate this idea to normal programmers. And so in the fall of 1972, shortly after I got to MIT, I had this wonderful aha moment. And uh, very few people are lucky enough to have a moment like this. And what happened to me was I all of a sudden saw that I could relate this idea of a very abstract multi-operation module to data types. And I felt that making that connection was going to be really beneficial because programmers understood data types. They programmed with data types all the time. And the connection was that the module was a data object. The operations were the operations of the object that you used to manipulate it. And people already used things like arrays, and they understood that you could add something to the array, remove something from the array. And they also understood that they thought about these things abstractly and did not have to actually understand how things were implemented underneath. And so I had this idea of abstract data types. And then, of course, you know, you're lucky enough to have an idea like that, but of course it doesn't stop there. I spent several years uh, trying to figure out what this idea really meant. How did you define it formally? What was an abstract data type conceptually? How did you specify them? How did you reason about their correctness? How did you design programs using the idea, and so on? Um, around about 1980, I switched into distributed systems, so that was the other part of the um, uh, award. And uh, so that was just an, an example of what I was doing in my career. I was opportunistically switching from one field to another as I saw really important problems. And uh, when working in distributed systems where I work today, uh, I got very interested in replication and so forth. So um, I've had a lovely career, and uh, I was lucky enough to have some good ideas. And uh, that's where I ended up. Well, thanks, Barbara. I have here a handful of questions that have been submitted by attendees. Uh, and I'm unlikely to be able to get to them all. But uh, let me start with several ones that I think should be easy that deal with the institution of the Turing Award itself. Okay, the first one is, uh, in 25 words or, le or less, how did the Turing Award change your life? Would anybody like to respond to that? <laughs> OK, well, if you decline responding to that, <laughs> let, let me get to one that's even shorter and um, considerably more blunt. Are Turing Awards really a good idea? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing this was submitted by somebody who doesn't have a Turing Award. <laughs> well, and if I had to guess, I, I would be able to guess a one-bit answer uh, that each of the awardees would, would give. But is this meeting a good idea? <laughs> I think they're very closely related questions. Uh, perhaps, but I, I, I make the assumption that none of you did the seminal work that you did. Uh, specifically in order to win a Turing Award, okay? So if it didn't have that effect on your behavior, did it, in fact, have any effect on your behavior as a social institution? Is it a positive thing? Anybody want to comment on that? Well, I'll so up. You know, it's not for individuals. It doesn't, you don't do research because you're thinking about the Turing Award. You do research because you find things that you are fascinated with that are interesting, useful to work on. It's probably good for the field because it gives us a history, it recognizes contributions, it gives people a way of thinking about the mm -hmm. history of the field. Of course, it's not perfect, because the people who get the award, they have to be nominated, the nomination has to be phrased properly, the committee has to be receptive, and so clearly there are going to be people who didn't get the award who deserved it, and there might be people that got the award who didn't deserve oh, okay. it, you know, who can say? But I think if you think about it sort of on average, it's a useful uh, thing for the field. 
Is, is it fair to have the model that, um, like tenure, people who have it think it's a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me move on to something that's closely well, related. I'll toss in an answer to that, if I might, too. I, I think, uh, just, I, I do have an opinion on it. So I think the Turing Award is great, and it, it, it adds some, some value to the field. But I think more important to the field are, are awards going to younger people before the promotion and tenure and yeah. so on, too. I think, uh, uh, I think that, that's, that's a critical thing to recognize accomplishment early in, in, in people's career. And a Turing Award tends not to do that. OK. Uh, a related question is, can you think of work that has already been done that deserves a Turing Award and hasn't yet received one? For example, would you like to make any predictions as to the 2012 Turing Award winner? <laughs> <laughs> You, after all, are pundits, and you we need to exercise your crystal ball a little bit. I'll step into that one. Uh, I'm not sure whether, I'm not sure I know exactly who to credit, but uh, I think there probably is not a person in this room that doesn't recognize the profundity of the contributions of, of Google. Mm -hmm. It's become a verb. <laughs> it's. Uh, it, People have thrown away their encyclopedias, and uh, it's, uh, um, it's a wonderful contribution to our uh, well-being and so forth. Uh, it had a predecessor, which isn't well known, Alta Vista. Uh, Butler, maybe you can talk about that. Uh, it, Google has succeeded uh, for reasons I don't fully understand myself, but uh, it. it uh, it's miraculously fast. Mm -hmm. It's fast because they have a lot of money. And they're clever, too, but it takes a lot of money. And the reason they have a lot of m money is that they figured out what very few people did, which is that you could make a lot, a lot of money out of targeted advertising. Mm -hmm. Well, aren't there similar institutions? I'm thinking of things like Wikipedia that doesn't have a lot of money that's also had a, a significant impact. Yes, I would put that in the same ballpark. <coughs> So money isn't essential. OK. Um, Whether money is essential depends on what it is you're trying to accomplish. Perhaps. Um, <laughs> it, for going to the moon, you need a lot of money. It, to index the, 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 the internet, you need a lot of money. OK, let me move on to another question, which may be viewed as superficial or profound, depending on your view. But it should be easy to answer. It actually, um, I'll read it in its entirety. Uh, it's addressed to each of the panelists. And the question is this. Do you have a Facebook account? <laughs> I haven't finished. A Twitter account? And why not? So. <laughs> so Barbara, fess up. Do you have a Facebook account? Absolutely not. A Twitter I don't account? Have neither Facebook nor Twitter. Can, can you, you give an a... email account? Of course I have an email account. <laughs> I'm not particularly interested in that kind of exposure. I'm not really interested in following people or having them follow me. But you know, I'm a person of my generation. And uh, I, if I were 40 years younger, I would probably have a completely different answer. Because I do think it's generational. We grew up in a certain way. We're used to a certain way of living. And you sort of settle into a rut. Oh. Yeah. So do I, I do think, though, that there's something quite dangerous going on in the internet, and Facebook is a good example of that because of the, the way people expose themselves, not understanding how, how they might regret that later. And I'm keenly aware of the dangers of the internet. And thank God for Ron and all the crypto, so I can at least do online banking. Uh, but I'm very careful even with email and what I will send because, uh, and you'd think politicians would learn this after a while. <laughs> Because everything you do like this is exposable, and I just don't care to be exposed. So, so, so actually, I, I do have a Facebook account. See? I do have a, a Twitter account. I make sure to log into Facebook at least once a quarter. <laughs> 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 Twitter at least once a decade. Yeah. So, okay, I, so my follow-on question for you, Ron, is what are you going to do about the 600 friend requests that you get <laughs> as a re result of that announcement? No promises. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Um, it's sometimes argued that all branches of computer science have enjoyed success because of the remarkable exponential growth, the Moore's Law growth for uh, over five decades. And so an interesting question is, uh, would your work be as celebrated as it is now? Would you even have done it 
if it hadn't been for this uh, you know, kind of Moore's law growth, this exponential growth in the impact of computers themselves. And there is kind of a rising tide floats all boats argument that uh, maybe good research has turned into great research uh, because of the economic and impact of, of all of this growth. Uh, it's certainly, it's certainly true for mo most. Um, it's certainly true for, for most practical systems work. We couldn't have done what we did at, at Park five years earlier. Uh, it just would, the hardware would have been impossible to build. Did you? Were you excited about building that hardware in anticipation that someday it would become cheap enough that Absolutely. people could put it in their pockets and, and have it at home? And Absolutely. I wrote a, a guest editorial on the subject in 1972. It was crystal clear that that would happen. Mm -hmm. But I think it's fair to say that was only, I suppose from the point of view of the welfare of the Xerox Corporation, that was quite essential. Um, we would probably have tried to do the work anyway, even if we couldn't have foreseen that future but we certainly did foresee it. Yeah, yeah I think in, in backing up what Butler said, uh, during the 70s and 80s, everybody working in any central area of computer science was keenly aware of the fact that computers were getting faster and faster, and so you could envision doing things today that weren't gonna be practical today, uh, but you were laying the framework for something that would be practical a little bit down the line. Yeah, I think even for theorists, uh, I think that is very important to do theory problems that are related to technology. Somehow the advances of technology bring out a lot of really interesting problems. And, and so that uh, I don't know whether it's coincidence or uh, there is a correlation that somehow things that have very heavy technological content also have very rich theoretical content. And uh, uh, I think that I was pretty lucky in uh, getting into this field. And uh, uh, I have been quite interested in combinatorial uh, problems, like Hardish problems. And, and, and uh, all those problems were very fascinating to me uh, at the time when I entered computer science. And I, was, I couldn't really decide uh, whether to work in combinatorial problems or, or doing something else like computer science. And uh, at some point, it suddenly hit me that uh, there were so many interesting mathematical problems in the world that uh, how do you decide which problems to work on? And computer science, being a very rapidly advancing field, uh, kind of breaks the symmetry. Somehow it, 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 it singles out problems that uh, is different from, from the uh, uh, typical mathematical problems. And, uh, uh, and I thought that was a good, a good choice. And I still don't understand whether there's a correlation, but somehow it, it seems so. Well, to put it um, more indelicately, uh, was there a, a, a bit of technological opportunism in your career choice then? Uh, not really. I, I think that, 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 uh, uh, that actually the, uh, uh, I first got into the theoretical computer science uh, from Don Knuth books, and and uh, so I think that when I when I first read the manuscript and the, and the, did the exercises in open problems, I didn't uh, really think of the opportunism in technology, but uh, uh, somehow later on, when I thought about deciding whether to pursue computer science or not, then I uh, realized that. Uh, uh, I mean, besides offering interesting problems, computer science also is a, is a new discipline. So, um, I, I think that, that uh, uh, at that time, I understood computer science was very, very new compared with mathematics. But now, after 40 years, when I think back, I realize that how close to the beginning I was uh, entering into that field. Because in the, when I entered that field, there were already many big names and, and, <laughs> and, 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 and people. But, but, uh, I think that uh, that it, it's it's not. I think that uh, it, it's very important to get into an area early. So I think that um, perhaps all of us have that advantage here. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, the evolution of, of the technology is was kind of foreseen by most people is in a misty way without recognizing everything. Uh, 
uh, clearly some of the uh, many computer vendors didn't see the impact of the micro of the processor on a chip very well <laughs> and are out of business. Uh, but uh, from the earliest days of, 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 of time sharing, and we, we had already discovered uh, social interaction in the form of messages to each other, which later evolved into email. Uh, initially, they were just messages within the system. Uh, and today, the social interaction extends to uh, Facebook and now even Twitter. Yes, I do have a Facebook account, but <laughs> I'm like Ron, I don't, I don't log in very well. I was coaxed into it by my, my uh, grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but uh, I, I, I too share with Barbara the uh, uh, hesitation to expose more than I have today on my website, uh, uh, which is a, a brief bio which is comparable to what you can find just by any normal Google search. Uh, so uh, the, uh, I, I think some of those reservations are because maybe we, we've been around long enough to recognize some of the, the disasters that occur when people make mistakes, but uh, I think uh, the, the, most people have that aha moment when they send an email they regretted and they realize <laughs> that they can't get it back and there's nothing they can do. And uh, that that's a, a was a revelation to everybody when they first discovered it. Well, maybe the next uh, Turing Award winner should be the person who admits the unsend key. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, I wanted to respond to your question too, if I could. Because theory is a bit different, I think. And, and uh, you know, the ability to do theory untethered to the technology of the day is, is, is a characteristic of theory, by, sort of by definition. Uh, and we see that today with, with quantum computing, right? Quantum, it's not clear at all whether we can build quantum computers. Uh, they're, they're maybe possible. But there's wonderful theory evolving. Scott Aronson and other people are, are working on, on, on this. And, and it's, um, uh, you know, it's an example of theory evolving independent of the technological underpinnings. And I think had, in response to your question, had the com computer technology frozen in the 60s uh, or the 70s, we, we would have seen much of the same theory evolved too. Maybe there wouldn't have been as much funding or something, I don't know, but, but it would have been the kinds of questions asked and the kinds of evolutions might have been very much the same. Uh, recall that NP-completeness uh, came about about that time too. Uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, of course, NP-completeness is sort of on the uh, pessimistic side of theory, it's sort of saying what you can't do maybe, and, and uh, so you don't need the, the hardware to, to do that. Uh, but uh, even public key was, was uh, ahead of its time in the sense that it really didn't have a utility until the web was invented until Tim. And, and but if the market hadn't developed for public key cryptography, uh, you think it, you still would have done it? You would just be an obscure number theorist instead of but a Turing there Award was winner? Act, there was a, a conference series started in the early 80s, uh, but I mean, the market for cryptography didn't really happen until the 90s. So it was a whole decade of, of vigorous uh, theoretical exploration before the market uh, happened there. So, so I, theoretical work and cryptography wow. is, is part of that. Mm -hmm. There's been a big market for cryptography for hundreds of years. Well, <laughs> not big in the sense of uh, yeah. not, not the volume. <laughs> the military like, market's always been there, of course, but uh, just so. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So. Okay, be before leaving the Moore's law thing, can we look at the potentially the dark side of it? Um, <laughs> is it possible uh, that the Moore's law growth of technology has made too much function available too fast that we haven't actually had time to develop mature engineering disciplines? Um, you know, there's a lot of complaints about the, the quality of, of software these days, for example. It, have, uh, it's the law of nature that there's always going to be a lot of complaints about the quality of software. Why is that? Because we always uh, raise our aspirations to the point where we can't quite do it or we can just barely do it. Yeah. So that's just words fail me. But, but, I, think, <laughs> but I actually think that... Uh, the much more serious implications are the sociological implications of computing. I mean, we heard yesterday in the talks about the financial markets, about the danger of completely uh, computer-controlled uh, trading. And I think if you look across our technology, you see this in many sectors, that we have developed the technology. I mean, I don't think the problem of the software is the big problem. I think it's the control of technology. But of course, this is not limited to our technology. Yeah, it's not as bad as nuclear fission. <laughs> <laughs> Just look at it that way when you start wringing your hands. 
But nevertheless, it's a serious problem. And, yeah. you know, it takes time for society to catch That's up like with, the, uh, with the innovation. I agree it's not with as, not agree as bad with as you, the Barbara. spinning jenny yeah. either. <laughs> okay, let's exercise your crystal ball a little bit more. Um, put yourself in the position of a uh, new PhD student just starting your career. What problem would you choose to work on? What do you think are the important problems that are facing computer science now and the ones where there are, is still dramatic progress to be made? I'll give the same answer I gave last time a similar question was asked on a panel. P equals NP. <laughs> Well, I would venture. Not always silences everybody. <laughs> now, now, For a short time. Okay, yeah. let, let me, would, would you actually, as a PhD supervisor with a new PhD student, would you advise him to tackle as a thesis topic settling the P equals NP question? No, that would be unwise. It's not I think quite that would well, be bad career advice. It's not quite what was asked. Well, I, I would advise uh, a, a really brilliant the uh, PhD students to work on the factoring of large integers by classical means, which may earth wrong uh, a bit, but I think that that's the right it's problem. we want to know the answer to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. I, th I think uh, machine learning is, is a really promising area. It's vibrant right now. There's a lot happening, and, and I think uh, new students with a lot of uh, mathematical or other skills could, could, could make progress there, and I think that's a, an area which, which is, can be recommended. Well, Ed Lazowski already gave my spiel on this subject yeah. um, yesterday. Uh, the most exciting, I think, it's very clear that all the um, sort of classical simulation and communica com communication applications of computing will continue to be interesting and important. Uh, the really hot area is going to be what I like to call embodiment, and what the NSF calls by the bureaucratic name cyber physical systems. Yeah. Which to me means computer systems that have non-trivial interactions with the physical world. This is something that's just getting started and it's gonna be even more interesting and important than the areas that have already been mined. So, so I, um, I thought Ed's talk yesterday was great and you gave me hope about systems again. I think that the characterization of systems going up and down the trough of despair and so forth, I think that's really right on. And um, it's very hard to answer the question for any of us, I think, of what we would do today, because we're not young anymore. And when you're young, you see the world a little differently than when you're not so young. My thought about today is that I still think there are very interesting issues in systems, but I also think that it's not really embodiment so more as much as the, uh, the, the combination of computer science and something else. Like, I do think uh, bi computational biology is really interesting. And so if I were starting off today, I, that's the kind of thing I might do. I think all of us benefited from the fact that we happened to see this new field and we were lucky enough to get in at the beginning of it. And I think that's a way that you have a really interesting career because there are just so many open problems that you can work on that people have not solved before. But it's very hard for us today to see what those... What well, isn't the flip do. side of that argument, to, to put it very cynically, that you guys have taken all the low-hanging fruit, you know, you, you, you've built these great systems in the 60s and 70s, and all the new PhDs can do is kind of fine-tune the fundamentals that you've laid down? Absolutely not. <laughs> Somehow they find interesting things. To That's right. Okay, um, so another uh, question from an attendee, uh, directed to all, and uh, it reads, isn't it time for parallel programming techniques that mortals can understand? Yeah. It is indeed. Yes, it that's is. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a really important question. And it's not clear to me that the answer is yes, that, the, that in the end we will succeed. And if we can't succeed, then that's going to limit the applicability of the huge multi-core computers. And that's not necessarily bad. It just means that the technology will go in one way or another. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no, you know, God did not say that computers had to have thousands of cores. But um, I think as a technical challenge, it's a huge, interesting problem right now. Is it a programming language problem, do you think? I think so, yeah. It's both a programming language problem and a, it's a methodology problem. Even more, because programming languages follow methodology. So it's a methodology problem. If we can figure out how to organize those programs, that's the first thing we have to do. 
then we can invent programming languages that support the methodology. But so far, we don't have too much of a clue about what to do with this. Yeah, we have, there's one striking counter example to that, which is MapReduce. Yes, but I don't think MapReduce goes all that far it, you know, in solving the, gen, the general class of problems. It, it goes nowhere in solving the general class of problems. Yeah. That's certainly true. But there is a large class of problems yeah. where we actually do have a reasonable answer. Well, is this, uh, should the question be actually limited to parallel programming? I mean, what about just everyday programming? It, uh, you know, one could ask the skeptical question that despite all that you've taught us about programming languages, Barbara, uh, you know, JavaScript has emerged as the most popular programming language in the world, and that's hardly an exemplar of your lessons. Uh, is that, <laughs> can that be interpreted as evidence that programming languages don't really matter that much? The correct way to look at JavaScript is it's a machine language. <laughs> well, it's a machine language that uh, a lot of lines of code are written in yeah. every year. O only for relatively small programs. People want to write That's changing. People want to write big programs. I don't think so. People want to write big programs. They write them in something else and they compile them into JavaScript so that the browser will run them. Yeah. I mean, it's a sad statement about our field that a lot of big programs start off as small programs. And when you're building a small program, you don't have to pay much attention to methodology because you can just do it through brute force. Willpower. Willpower, <laughs> rather than brute force. The same. It's a okay. form of willpower, <laughs> right. <laughs> and then, you know, so this is why there's so much stuff written in languages that are not really all that great, because you start off this way, you don't have to think about it hard. Then when you get to the big problems, you know, you're in trouble. But it, but it's, I don't know how to solve this. No, but we're okay. For the reason that I said, JavaScript is a machine language. You can yeah. write your program in any language you want. Okay, I have a question addressed to uh, Butler, Barbara, and Corby. And the question is this. As computation becomes increasingly distributed, should we rethink the role of the operating system? So there's a very healthy operating system community that thinks about this all the time. Uh, my basic belief is that distributed computing is probably the source of inspiration for parallel computing. Distributed computing actually is not in bad shape. And uh, it is the way that Google does all its work today. It is the way that, in fact, companies that have lots and lots of processors, those are parallel machines in a sense. It's just that they use a particular uh, memory model and a particular way of thinking about how computation is, is organized. Yeah, they run MapReduce. Um, some of them run MapReduce, some of them don't. <laughs> Most of them do, actually. <laughs> if you get down to the systems level, they're not running MapReduce. They're implementing MapReduce. <laughs> that is undeniably true. They're um, running some boring variant of Unix down at the system level. Yeah, it's not clear to me that the operating systems are different. That, you know, the problems that people look at in the operating system, they change a little bit. The way you do load balancing, your notions of virtualization, they may evolve a bit, but it's not clear that they're very different than yeah. what they were. Well, not, how much, about the, how? not much has changed in operating systems since the mid-70s. And that's not for, in my opinion, that's not for commercial reasons. It's because we haven't had any great new ideas. Aren't, aren't there people who argue that the web is now our operating system? I have no idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> yes, certainly there are people who argue that, but I have no idea what it means. <laughs> OK. Um, here's a question, um, perhaps for our theorists. Has there been any progress made in the question of P equals NP over the last 20 years? <laughs> and do, 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 people, do people still work on this problem? I think that uh, there are people who still work on this problem, mm -hmm. as evidenced by the claim of solving P equal to NP or the other way every few years. I think that the most recent one uh, appeared uh, with a very high publicity uh, about a year ago. And uh, so I think there are people who still work on it. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the last one uh, uh, got some, uh, uh, I think that most of the claims people just brushed off. But somehow the last one got a little bit more uh, esteem. And, uh, uh, and, and so, uh, my feeling is that, is, is that um, there has not been any real progress of P equal to NP. So um, uh, I, I think basically it's a very, I think that if you 
want to win a Turing Award by working on P equal to NP. Butler, sorry, I think that it probably um, is not a good idea for a PhD student. <laughs> I, I don't deny that. <laughs> well, we have made some progress, but of a negative sort. Uh, I mean, we, we do know why certain classes of arguments don't work. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of yeah. the arguments relativize, or there's other issues with them. Yeah. Uh, so so we're, we're getting more frustrated, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we're understanding the, the narrow path we have to follow to, to come up with a proof, maybe. OK. OK, let me um, ask you to turn up the gain on your crystal ball a lot. Uh, there will presumably be a celebration like this in 2061 of MIT's 200th anniversary. Um, will there be a Turing session? Will there be Turing awards? Will it be Turing computer science? Will computer science have just assimilated into other disciplines like math and physics? Any ideas? Well, I could speak up and say that I don't expect to be there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, we will certainly reserve a place for you, nonetheless. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I, have a, I have a feeling that, um, that uh, at MIT 200, there will still be Turing Awards. And actually, at that time, I think contrary to what you think, I think that uh, computer science has uh, absorbed physics and biology <laughs> and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. Okay, the person moderating the panel, Steve, will be a robot. It won't be a person. Okay. <laughs> will the panelists be robots as well? We don't know. I don't we know. don't know. <laughs> Intriguing <laughs> possibility. Yeah. Okay. At, at the I, I, ACM's 50th anniversary celebration, which was uh, in 1997, my then boss, Nathan Merval, made a prediction about what would happen. What would be going on 50 years in the future, they asked a lot of people to do this. I would never have dared to make a prediction about what computing is going to be like in, yeah. in 50 years. But Nathan is fearless. He predicted uploading. Mm -hmm. So uploading means you get to upload your consciousness into a computer. <laughs> Why would you want to do that? Well, you can be immortal. Great. And it seems to me, if you're a materialist, you can't really rule this out. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, well. I <laughs> <laughs> on, on, on that profound thought, um, <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to close this session by resurrecting a, uh, an old tradition that Mike Dertuzzo started many decades ago. Uh, he uh, hosted the Distinguished Lecturer Series of LCS, which is now called the Dertuzzo's Lectures, and made a practice of asking each of his distinguished lectures to summarize their life experience into a one-sentence lesson. So I'm going to put each of you on the spot and ask you for your sort of one-sentence words of wisdom. And of course, you're all Turing Award panelists, so you have the, grave, the strong advantage that you can say something that's merely inscrutable, and the audience <laughs> will interpret it as profound. <laughs> so Corby, can I ask you to start? Uh, I'll, I'll give it a stab. I think if there's any single thing that uh, a piece of advice one could give it, it is to follow your enthusiasm, whatever that may turn out to be. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, take advantage of the uh, ambiance of a place like MIT, uh, where uh, you can be take it, you can where one has to recognize that one, in order to, to enjoy your life, you have to consider yourself a lifelong student. And, uh, and you really should take a drink from the fire hose. <laughs> Thank you, Corby. <laughs> Butler? I think Corby said it very well. You should do something that you really like doing. And if you like doing lots of things, I suggest that you can consider either biology or chemistry or uh, computing as the hot fields for the next two or three decades, at least. Good. Barbara? Um, so I think you should be opportunistic. I think opportunism is a good thing. And what it means is you look around and you see what's moving and what's open. And then you should focus on what are the important problems and avoid doing incremental work. And if it requires changing your field, then you shouldn't be afraid to do that. 
Ron? I guess it's a very much in the same sort of spirit. Um, the uh, thing I would advise students would be to, to ask questions based on the technology, the hot technology of the day, but to ask them in such a way and, and, and try to derive answers that'll be interesting a couple decades from now. Good, Andy? My advice would be, uh, for the students, would be to always try to do something that is just a little bit beyond your ability. Okay, great. Well, I'd like to thank our distinguished panelists. <laughs>